All right. I am uh, now joined uh, by uh, Luke Savage as a staff writer at uh, Jacobin and the author of a, a piece called The Class War at Walmart uh, and uh, by um, a multiple time returning guest, uh, Liza Featherstone, uh, who is a, a Jacobin columnist and has uh, uh, and has also, uh, you know, written a bunch uh, about Walmart. So I thought it might be fun to uh, to have uh, Liza join us. So thank thank both of you so much for coming. Cheers. For me. All right. So um, so so Luke, I mean, let's you know, I figured we'd just kind of like start with the piece and then see uh, see where they took us. But um, you. Um, <laughs> so the first thing uh, that you uh, that you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, is about uh, Doug McMillan, who is the CEO of uh, of Walmart. Uh, you also mentioned the uh, uh, Chris. I have no idea how to pronounce this. I am, uh, despite having grown up in an area where lots of Polish people live, I, I am uh, I'm awful at this. But uh, the uh, but uh, the CEO of McDonald's, uh, and in uh, in both cases, you uh, you sort of start by framing the whole thing by talking about. Uh, their um, uh, their earnings uh, in uh, uh, 2018, which I guess is the last time the information was available for this. So, um, so it's you say uh, that uh, McMillan took home uh, 23 million. Uh, the McDonald's CEO uh, was uh, was paid only 18 million. Uh, which uh, which still means that he's making about two thousand times the median wage for uh, for workers at his company. I think in the in the Walmart case, it's a little bit greater. Uh, so uh, so so take me uh, take me through this because you, you in the uh, in the article, like I think you paint a picture of like what like how stark like those those gaps are at these companies that might be a little bit surprising even to people who basically like you know have a rough idea. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think it's useful. Uh, you know, I think it's useful to think about the narrative. You know, kind of just to set up the context here. It's useful to think about the kind of general narrative. A lot of people, and I think even a lot of us, have kind of internalized around the pandemic, which is a narrative of kind of broadly shared pain, right? <laughs> um, you know, a particularly economic pain. Uh, you know, we read a lot in the news these days about, uh, you know businesses, particularly small businesses, uh, you know, closing, you know, probably if anybody, uh, you know, if you're living in a city, there are probably businesses in your neighborhood that you've seen close. Um, you're probably reading, you know, as Congress negotiates these big, uh, these big stimulus packages, these relief programs, um, you're reading about or you're hearing about large industries requiring these massive federal bailouts to stay afloat. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and that's to say nothing of all the stories about ordinary people suffering uh, through eviction waves and high unemployment and, and things like that. Um, and, you know, that's all that's all true. Uh, but what that uh, what that narrative that I think, you know, as I said, I think to some extent, all of us have kind of internalized what that misses is that the pandemic has actually been incredibly profitable Um for you know, in, in some in some sections of the economy, you know, particularly for big retail corporations or those connected to food services. Um, so, uh, you know, just to kind of go a little further into some of the data you alluded to, you were talking about the uh, the CEOs and how much money they made. Um, but it's also the case that you know, uh, companies like Walmart and McDonald's. It's not just that they are continuing to be profitable during the pandemic; their profits are actually going up. Um, you know, Walmart uh, made about five billion in the third quarter of 2020, according to newly released data. Uh, McDonald's uh, uh, profits went up about five percent, I think, from the previous quarter. If you take the uh, 15 biggest retail companies, which obviously includes Walmart, who I who are, I think the biggest, they collectively made about 61 billion in profits uh, this year so far. And of course, the year is not even over, which if you compare it to uh, the same time window last year uh, is a 15, uh, nearly $15 billion uh, increase. So that's, uh, that's how they're doing. Um, but I was struck by this study that uh, came out of the Government Accountability Office, which is this kind of nonpartisan office connected to Congress. It's a study commissioned by, uh, by Bernie Sanders 
um, which basically analyzed how many working age adults uh, are using are using uh, food or having to make use of food stamps and Medicaid to these two large federal aid programs. Um, food stamps, I guess, officially being called SNAP. Um, and the analysis is pretty interesting. Uh, they looked at uh, where people are working uh, specifically who are claiming these benefits. And so I was interested in uh, diving into that in a little more detail, given the kind of wider context we're talking about. And unsurprisingly, McDonald's and Walmart are kind of two of the biggest offenders for uh, having large numbers of people employed uh, with them that uh, are having to use uh, both SNAP and Medicaid. Yeah, uh, and and I think that, uh, in, in fact, I remember not that long ago, like a few weeks ago, seeing uh, Doug McMillan, the CEO of Walmart, uh, talking about how, you know, Congress needs to pass another stimulus and uh, and talking about how many people were suffering. And, you know, he, he sort of said, like he made some kind of comment in passing, like, well, some of us have been, able, you know, better able to weather the storm, mm -hmm. but, you know, like. It's one way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? I mean, that's, you know, like this is not weathering the storm. This has been yeah. a, uh, this has been a massive windfall, uh, you know, for them. Um, and, but the, the problem, you know, is, uh, is, is certainly like a, a pre-existing one. I mean, just sticking with the example of Walmart, you know, for, uh, for a minute, like, this is, you know, even before the pandemic, when they've they've made all of this money by, um, you know, basically, um, I think, I think probably the fact that people are stocking up more, you know, each time they go to the grocery store, uh, the Walmart, you know, has, you know, delivery tons of places, and uh, and I think they have curbside pickup like everywhere now, um, but. Um, but even you know even before this i mean this exacerbates you know what exists exists before and it's very galling because i know that they've been like super slow um doing um and yeah right as somebody points out in the chat you know kind of the same deal for uh, for mcdonald's you know drive throughs are built for social distancing you know you don't have to uh you don't have to go inside uh to, yeah. you know to how oh, you're saying Liza? oh just um th that you know one of the reasons that they're doing so well is um I mean, they're, they uh, Walmart always does well in a, a recession, um, and um, and essentially it's a, um, I mean, uh, and and it also, um, it, I mean, it tends to produce poverty wherever it goes, because for the reasons that um, that Luke mentioned in his article, like the wages are low, um, but um, but it also tends to. Uh, benefit from pro uh, from poverty because um, because when people are poor they need the discounts and they tend to seek out Walmart over other options and so so the pandemic when people are like large numbers of people are feeling um, much more insecure than usual is a great time for Walmart I mean just to like and and it's like right. and that's the, you know that's always the case um, so. That's so that's part of it, but also the context in in context this um this dynamic that Luke pointed to um, and it was, yeah um, you know excellent piece and a great study commissioned by by Bernie Sanders um, that's been part of Walmart's business model for a long time that um that the company is um, is subsidized by food food stamps and Medicaid and often when um, and employees there um, have have told me about um, you know that it's just like you know most jobs you fill out your tax forms and you know you give them your ID and your social security number and you fill out your you know your various hiring paperwork and part of that process with Walmart um, is they explain to you how to sign up for food stamps <laughs> because you might need it and you know and so that's like it, it's just it's just part of the um it, it's part of the business model and they understand um that um that 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 they benefit from these government programs you know and in an ideal world like we'd all benefit from great government programs that we're subsidizing right. And you know, you know, providing uh, benefits that our employers didn't have to um, provide. Um, but but the sort of irony of that is, um, I mean, is actually Walmart has been uh, when when the members of the Walmart family um, and the you know the Walmart 
CEOs and um, and you know and you know trade organizations and other things that they're uh, affiliated with. When um, when Walmart is active in the public sphere, it crusades against precisely the kinds of politics that um, that support such public programs. So you know, on the one hand, um, they're they're so they're directly profiting from the very kind of um, social liberalism that they're um, at, that they actually oppose. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I wanted to ask about that, and you know, part of the, uh, you know, I mean, I, and I want, you know, when you'd be part of this conversation, you know, the the sort of uh, the the lame joke I was making when I was promoting this on social media, you know, like calling back to the um, the the Daily Show thing where everybody they talk to about every subject is the senior blank correspondent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, you know, but you have, uh, you know, you have written a lot uh, a lot about Walmart in the past. So, uh, so you you might know more about like some of the um, some of that lobbying that you were talking about, you know, that their their activity, you know, in in the public square. Because I know, uh, you know, because I know it hasn't been like completely uniformly like that. So, like 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 Doug McMillan, um, I, I know has a, like made comments in interviews and stuff. Oh, you know, minimum wage is probably too low. Yeah, those kinds of things they accept after the fact, you know, so like, you know, once, um, once their wages have reached a certain level, you know, they're they're in favor of the minimum wage being increased to that, because, um, you know, they want to, uh, they they want to, they want to deprive the competition of the option of paying wages lower than theirs, you know, so like, so that's, um, you know, but um, but in in general, the lobbying efforts have been um, opposed uh, opposed to raising wages. Um, definitely opposed to any kind of um, like you know any efforts to make it easier for workers to organize unions. Um, you know those uh, like th- those those kinds of um, yeah. You know, I mean, so so I know those kinds of basic sort right. of floor basics are like Walmart knows are really important in, in, in its interests. Yeah. Right. Um, so like, I, I know that they have, um, you know, even though he said the minimum wage is probably too low, that there are people who've been working at Walmart for many years. who are still making less than 15 bucks an hour. So, you know, it's a pretty mm-hmm. Yeah, he doesn't support at least in advance, you know, raising it to that. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess so, but um, I mean, it, it's it, they wouldn't necessarily mind having it be a little bit more uniform, like you know. Um, but um, and and at this point, fifteen dollars an hour is really, um, you know, people have been advocating for fifteen an hour for like ten years. <laughs> so at this point, it's like not that redistributive a demand anymore. Um, you know, I mean, because- yeah, which, which which makes it amazing that Walmart is actually still paying people who've been working there for so long. You know, not quite that. Exactly. Um, That's like, yeah that that would that would be the that would be the real issue. But um, you know, and I mean, in terms of the and in terms of the political giving, like you'll you'll notice like they um, they would mostly give to. Um, you know, they would they would mostly give to Republicans and centrist Democrats. So like their 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 political donation would be like aligned with this kind of um, um, with, with with this kind of um, economically conservative politics. Yeah. So uh, so the thing that you're um, that you're bringing up there, Luke, about how uh, how they do pay. Um, you know, that, uh, well, you know, they pay people so little and also they provide, you know, so few benefits, you know, that, uh, that they are in massively propped up, you know, by, by things like, uh, Medicaid and, uh, and SNAP, um, which, which presumably, I mean, I guess getting back to what, you know, Lads was saying that like, presumably their ideal policy preferences, you know, I mean, I'm sure they don't want those programs, you know, going away anytime soon because it, uh, it, it gets them off the hook. But, uh, but, uh, but of course, like any big employer, I think that they, uh, they do understand that their interests are served by not having other things be, um, uh, be universal uh, because if uh, if they if they were universal, if you know, if we had, you know, if we had Medicare for all, you know, then if you're a Walmart, you know, like if you're a, full-time Walmart employee, uh, you know, who, uh, who is getting employer, you know, employer health insurance, then, uh, then that, um, you know, that would really increase, uh, your ability to, um, 
you know, to do things like like form a union, uh, you know, without because one of the biggest reasons that people don't uh, is they're afraid of being fired, uh, uh, which at Walmart is extremely rational. They've they've closed down lots of stuff to to prevent uh, unionization, um, but they. Uh, so, uh, so they, they presumably, uh, you know, like presumably like they like it, you know, they like it like exactly where it is that, uh, that they can, you know, that they've got some means tested stuff to like help prop up their reliance on part-time labor. Uh, but, uh, but also they, they don't get, you know, they don't have to deal with the consequence of that more, uh, of that more militant, uh, workforce. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Liza, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and those benefits are so little that they, um, at, to your point, then they provide no exit strategy for employee, employees. Like, you can't be like, oh, I'm going to quit my job because I have food stamps. And like, it's like, it's not a viable um, backup. Whereas, yeah, Medicare for all, um, Walmart would benefit in, in a sort of narrow way from Medicare for all because they would not have to pay um, um, their employees um, any health insurance at all, but they understand that in a class struggle sense as employers, um, that they would not benefit from um, employees being able to have that freedom to just like, yeah, and pres- their job is terrible. <laughs> you know? why, despite yeah. the fact that it would be a, a short, like a technically it would be a short term windfall for them. Presumably that's why they're not out there lobbying for it, but you're yeah. just- Exactly. They're not They're. That's why they're not um, um, doing that. Something, uh, something I find myself thinking about a lot these days is the study which found that uh, the, the, the brief uh, was just for several months, the uh, $600 unemployment checks that some people were getting at the onset of the pandemic, a study which found that, um, you know, those checks, first of all, averted a pretty catastrophic spike in poverty that otherwise would have occurred. But but yeah. but secondly, and I think it's very revealing, um, particularly and, and, you know, germane to this conversation, found that uh, huge numbers of people, uh, you know, receiving that benefit, possibly a majority, although they'd have to go back and check, were actually getting more money at six hundred dollars a week. Than they were if they uh, than than they were when when they were working at Walmart or or wherever before they were laid off. Um, something well, else, I, yeah. it's which is which is astonishing. And something else I think about a lot is uh, when there was uh, when there was a discussion in Congress, I guess in August or September, um, about uh, kind of the next round of of coronavirus policies. Uh, you know, these six hundred dollar checks were obviously kind of central to that, and. Uh, you know the the Republicans obviously wanted to claw them back, and interestingly enough, Steny Hoyer, uh, one of the senior Democrats in in the negotiations, actually was kind of conceding that uh, well, if we give people too much uh, money, it's going to be a disincentive for them to return to work. Um, and I think that speaks to why companies like Walmart uh, would be against uh, kind of universal social democratic benefits like Medicare for all, despite the fact that it would probably, in the short term, save them money. Um, uh, an American workforce, which is, you know, empowered and has more financial independence and is not as tied to employers to receive basic benefits like access to medical care is going to be one that's a lot hard to hire from. People don't want to work at companies like Walmart. They're awful places to work. Um, uh, and actually, uh, I, I guess this is kind of uh, stepping back to an earlier point in the conversation. But um, one one other thing about this report uh, that I think is really important. This is uh, the initial report we were talking about. Um, you know, the the number of people who are claiming these federal benefits, Medicaid and SNAP, that work at companies like Walmart and uh, and McDonald's. Um, these so these are this is about uh, this is about twenty one million people all told. Um, not not working at those two companies, but uh, but working age adults who claim those benefits. 70% of those people are working full-time schedules. So schedules of 35 yeah. hours a week or more. And I think that's a really important detail to get in here because, you know, there's been a pretty noxious discourse, a kind of bipartisan discourse for the last several decades, which um, has kind of, you know, it sort of came with the overturning of the New Deal consensus and was all about kind of stigmatizing benefits and the people who receive them. Um, the kind of uh, underlying logic being that if somebody's claiming a benefit, they're probably just not working very hard. There's probably something suspect about them. 
Um, you know, if you're just if you're just in work and you put in the hours, you don't need these things, which are basically just a kind of stopgap that only a few people should be receiving to stop them falling into extreme poverty. Um, but that's just not the case. It's not what the numbers tell us at all. Yeah. Um, there are there are tens of millions of people in the United States who are working full time hours and still have to you know, are paid so little by companies like Walmart and McDonald's that they uh, are forced to turn to these programs. Yeah, that's an incredibly important point, Luke. Um, and because it's it's often, you know, a lot of people will look at those these numbers that we had been discussing and assume, oh, those are part time workers. And so, you know, of course, they're, you know, or or they're like staying home with the kids or, you know, um, and so, th so that's why they need these benefits. And it, yeah, and, and in fact, no, they're working full time and they're very poor. Another thing is that, um, when even when you consider um, the portion of that um, workforce that is um, part time, um, a lot of them are not choosing to be part time. Like Walmart right. and other companies use um, your um, precarity and um, um, and uh, like not putting you on the schedule as a disciplinary mechanism. You know that you know you don't know if you're going to get enough hours week by week um, and um, and you know makes it very difficult for the employee to plan like to know when they should when they're going to be able to pick up their kids and like plan their lives and possibly like when they're going to work their other job um, you know and um, but the reason like the, the reason for it um, is that it keeps them on their toes like they're like oh I better behave myself at work or I might not get enough hours um, and also the lack not giving them enough hours can also be a way of not providing them with any health benefits yeah i was going to say like in, in the in the medicaid case i guess um you know i guess everybody who's on medicaid i think would have to be uh technically part-time because if if they if they were technically full-time they would have to um I think they would uh, have to give them uh you know employer health insurance at least after a certain amount of time uh, but uh, but that doesn't mean that they're actually part time, right? Like they they could right. there are lots of people, yeah. um, and you know whatever. Like this is this is like in the neoliberal hellscape we live in. This has become pervasive in everything. Like you know academia does this. You know they, like all the all the adjuncts who are teaching exactly one class less than yeah. uh, than what they'd have to you know exactly. they, the the threshold after which they'd have to give them better you know reclassify them as full time and give them benefits. Uh, and uh, and and companies like Walmart, you know, McDonald's, uh, like do this all the time. You know, they make they they make sure that people have exactly one hour less on the schedule yeah. than you know yeah. they would have to to you know to have to be legally forced to uh, reclassify them as full time and pay the benefits, which is actually something that's sometimes used as a uh, a, a right wing argument. Like, oh, look at these perverse incentives that you're creating that are hurting the very people. Blah blah blah. But um, but of course. It's really the opposite. It's a uh, it's a reason, you know. It's it's a reason to just have universal non means tested benefits. Yeah, exactly. Something else that I think is worth pointing out here is that you know obviously we talk about companies like uh, you know Walmart in particular because they're symbolic of something larger. I mean Walmart has kind of been uh, you know it's kind of been corporate criminal number one or you know certainly in the top, uh, you know, the, it's it, it's certainly certainly up there and has been for some time. Um, and, you know, the reasons for that are pretty obvious. I mean, Walmart is a company that sells, uh, you know, cheaply goods that are cheaply manufactured abroad for incredibly low prices, bargain basement prices, um, you know, in North America, and then, uh, you know, employs people at bargain basement wages uh, to to do that. And then, you know, uh, relies on these federal subsidies to, to keep the model afloat. Um, but it's worth also just, uh, you know, since we're talking about these particular federal benefits and all the people working at these companies claiming them, you know, Walmart and McDonald's alone, I mean, they employ so many people. I mean, this is kind of beyond the symbolic here, just Walmart taken by itself. I mean, Walmart is the largest employer in the United States. Um, it employs, I'm not sure about the American workforce, but I think globally, the last figure I saw is a little over 2 million people. So that's 
know, when, when your workforce is that large, yeah, this, 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 this might be just, just to interject this, this might be, um, this might be dated or I might be remembering it wrong, but I believe the only larger employer, like there's like maybe like two or three larger employers in the world. And like one of them is like the people's liberation army in China, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the largest private employer in the United States. The largest is the federal government, but, um, yeah. but it is, it's definitely, it's, it, I think it, it employs about 1.3, 1.4 people in the United States. Right. So so when you're employing that many people, when your workforce exists on that scale, the wage policies at this one company alone actually have pretty significant spillover effects. Okay. You know, uh, is this something Liza pointed out in her great uh, 2019 piece for Jacobin on on Walmart about Bernie showing up at the, uh, the shareholders meeting? You know, Walmart... Uh, uh, when and it's something you alluded to earlier, Liza, when you said that you know Walmart, this is a company that kind of brings poverty wherever it wherever it comes. I mean, the existence of a, an employer so large in many places that pays these kind of wages drags down the entire labor market. Um, and uh, and when it comes to uh, these benefits programs, you know Walmart and McDonald's. I mean, I was I was you know really struck uh, going through the report. I picked out a few kind of choice numbers to illustrate this. Really struck by. Uh, just looking at Walmart and McDonald's alone, uh, how many uh, recipients of these programs they account for in some places. So for example, uh, perhaps the most striking number is that in Georgia, there are about uh, 136,000 working age recipients of food stamps. So that's the uh, that's the February figure if you exclude the, un or the self-employed. Um, and of those 136,000, uh, just under 6,000 are employed at either Walmart or McDonald's. So that's, that's Roughly four and a half percent, just in this one state, are just employees of those two companies. Um, so it's not just that you know these companies are uh, you know and their and their wage policies are symbolic of uh, you know exploitation in American capitalism, even though they are. It's also that they are themselves uh, you know they are participating in that exploitation on a non-negligible scale. If you altered the wage policies just at these two companies, it would have significant spillover effects into the rest of the economy as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, both in the sense that they, that competitors um, are going you know, to have an incentive to keep their wages similarly down, you know, to, uh, to compete with Walmart and also um, that the, um, that the prices Walmart is willing to pay to their suppliers, you know, there's the incentive, you know, there's like with Walmart and, um, you know, like this is something uh, Lee Phillips and uh, Mikhail Rosworski talk about, they're both the People's Republic of Walmart. There's like, there's this sort of the Walmart like extended empire, you know, that uh, of, of companies that solely exist to do business with Walmart, you know, and, and are essentially part of Walmart. And then even beyond that, of course, there are lots of companies that do a significant portion of the business with Walmart and the, the like Walmart's, you know, corporate policies depress wages throughout that entire system. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, as, as Lee and Michael argue, I mean, you know, if, if, if Walmart were um, forced to, um, to um, be better, um, it would have a tremendous ripple effect. Um, I looked at years ago um, when Walmart started to, um, be a major purveyor of organic produce and you know i mean it's like that's you know you can be a little skeptical about the claims and you know the you know what is organic but you know it's basically like um like millions of acres of um of you know toxins that will not go into the earth as a result of like walmart you know, um, it, like shifting much of its like of its produce over um, to organic um and i say that not to praise walmart for that but to just like that was something that um happened as a a result of market forces and there's no market forces that are going to force um, walmart to treat its employees better but if forced, you know, um, by um, you know different political, different organized political forces, I mean, it would be seismic. It would have a seismic effect on the quality of life for Americans. Yeah, I mean, so so the two the two ways you could do that would either be uh, political action, of course, uh, or uh, unionizing Walmart, and uh, and the latter has been something that you know people have been attempting for a very, very long time. And, you know, with, with, you know, extraordinarily limited success. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, I think on that, um, you know, every, every every few years, Walmart workers in the United States um, do, um, do, you know, take action, walk out, um, you know, do um, um, Black Friday strikes are actually frequent. Um, I, I actually didn't hear about any this year, but it's a weird year. Um, and, um, um, and, you know, now and then someone um, will try to organize their specific Walmart store. Um, there used to actually be more action around this in Canada. Um, but, um, but it's, um, it, it's very, um, it's very difficult to do that without changing the larger political context um, in which that happens. I think they, um, that Walmart workers would need to be supported by a much um, um, stronger labor movement and um, and by a, a much more friendly regulatory structure um, of the kind that um, Bernie Sanders ran on, actually. I mean, he, he really um, ran on very specific um, labor law changes, um, you know, th that would make it much easier for workers to organize unions, um, and um, and and also to organize um, workers um, across, like by sector, which would really have a tremendous effect for Walmart workers, and is done in many other countries. So, I, I mean, I, I think that um, it's the kind of thing that. It just, you know, it used to be, uh, um, it used to be something that the um, that that unions were criticized for not doing a better job of it. Um, Walmart workers themselves <laughs> were criticized for not doing a better job of unionizing themselves. And I mean, it, it's just, it is a much bigger. Um, it, it calls for structural changes that we're all responsible for organizing. Uh, I think. Um, I will just say, speaking to the specific issue of employees at these companies having to make use of federal programs, as far as I could tell, um, this is actually quite easily fixable. Uh, and not even, like, I don't mean in the sense that uh, it could be fixed through legislation in Congress. It's even easier than that. Um, as far as I could tell, um, you know, something the Biden administration could do if it was interested in doing is uh, simply issue an executive order. And I think there's precedent for this if you look at past executive orders issued under Obama, uh, which, you know, would ban any company from federal contracts unless they paid their workers a living wage or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, in the past, I believe, uh, I think it's Walmart, I'd have to uh, go back through my notes, but, um, you know, I think it's Walmart has, has actually taken uh, tremendous efforts to uh, retain its status as a federal contractor. So clearly, mm -hmm. this is something they care about. Um, but, you know, as, as I think yeah. the, uh, the, the the Steny Hoyer, uh, you know, incident I alluded to earlier, where he was, you know, he, you know, it's Steny Hoyer is a Democrat, right? And he's basically yeah. saying, well, we can't pay people too much during a pandemic, because they're not going to go back to their dangerous jobs for, you know, at Walmart <laughs> and McDonald's. Um, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. So, you know, I mean, the, the, the balance of, you know, the balance of forces, you know, even, uh, you know, even where the Democratic Party and its leadership actually have plenty of room to maneuver, um, like through, you know, executive orders and things like that, the balance of forces, uh, you know, is such that, you know, there's such a bias towards these big employers um, that, I mean, I think, unfortunately, there's very little likelihood of, of, uh, of, of, of something like that happening. I have a very hard time imagining Joe Biden, um, you know, even in kind of the first 100 days, particularly when you look at some of the people he's, you know, determined to appoint to cabinet, it does not seem like we're about to get an activist administration that's going to be interested in these kind of things, even when, you know, they uh, they're able. But I do think it's worth uh, it's worth registering that if if there was a political will to fix this kind of problem, uh, it's 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 eminently fixable. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, um, we certainly look like smarter analysts um, if if we say that's not going to happen. But I think it's actually better um, to say um, to what what you just said, Luke, which is um, which is um, this is within Biden's power to fix, you, you know, and um, and I think people really, um, you know, we're going to start hearing, especially if the Democrats don't um, win in Georgia, we're going to start hearing their hands are tied. What do you expect? You know, it's yeah. the Republican Senate. And, uh, like, and it's really important to keep in mind how much the executive branch can do. And federal contracts is an excellent example 
on the environmental level too, there's just tremendous like amount of things that they could do um, with with federal contracts, and um, and you know and and the agency level is 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 pretty pretty significant, and they have some Biden has has some pretty progressive people on his team. So I mean that's it's not. I, I don't say that to say, oh yeah, I think Biden's going to do this, but you know, but all this to say, um, he is um, he is vulnerable to um, to pressure, and he, he should he should not get away with uh, my hands are tied because the Republicans are so bad. Um, excuse. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, like we certainly need to spend the next you know four years pointing out uh, relentlessly. All of the things that, that he could do, uh, exactly. uh, which so I mean, you know, which is like, yeah, I mean, in this case, certainly, right, really concretely, right. We just said that you know Walmart's, um, you know, has this disproportionate, you know, like even aside from uh, from itself taking up this this huge chunk of the economy, it also has a disproportionate effect on the rest. And, you know, sure, like lots of businesses are never going to get federal contracts, but Walmart, you know, Walmart is, you know, so, so this could, uh, you know, this could have a big impact on them. Uh, and, uh, and also, you know, in, uh, in general, right? Like, uh, cause uh, I think that, you know, I've seen, there's a claim that's been floating around. I don't completely know what to, to make of this, although on the face of it, it seems pretty unassailable that there's actually um, a, a provision in the ACA that uh, that says that if you uh, if like a, a state of emergency has been declared, you know, for for public health, you know, health reasons, uh, exposure, you know, to uh, you know to uh, to you know public health problems in a given uh, in a given area, uh, then uh, then you can by executive order uh, make people in that area eligible uh, for uh, for uh, for you know for Medicare who aren't seniors, mm. uh, which uh, which I think was like put in there as like some sort of like really specific carve out because of like this one area in, you know, Montana, you know, there was like a political favor, you know, I think for, uh, uh, for, uh, for a given Senator. Uh, That's wild. I didn't know about this. So. Yeah. Um, well, all, um, you know, so there's, yeah, I think uh, Kyle Kalinske did a thing about this and, and, you know, and I, I read the article and I, I still, you know, having read it, like I, I, I sort of don't, you know, still, don't entirely know what know what to think because it sounds a little bit too good to be true. But uh, if uh, if that is the case, uh, at the uh, at the very least, right? You know, I mean, even if you know, I mean, obviously the argument would then be, hey, a state of emergency has actually been declared for the entire United States because of COVID, uh, and uh, whether you know, of course, I think that there is a great chance that even if this is you know what it looks like that. Uh, in the extraordinarily unlikely event that Biden actually did this, uh, that the you know the Supreme Court would very quickly find a reason to say that that's not you know that's not what they meant, you know right when they when they put that into the law, but you know for God's sake why not at least make them do that? Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I very much agree with uh, with that, and and also agree with what you just said, Liza. I mean, I think that there are two. There are really two reasons to. Uh, there are really two reasons to push on stuff like this. I mean, the first is in the hopes that the, the pressure will actually uh, yield some results. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the second is, uh, you know, and this is maybe not as important in the short term, but I think in the long term probably is pretty important. Um, you know, is if if the Biden administration is not going to uh, is not going to take kind of this activist posture, if it's not going to do the kind of kinds of things even through executive order that people like us would like to see, um, it's important at least to register that uh, they did have an option. I mean, when you yeah. when you look at the narrative that a lot of people have internalized around uh, Obama's eight years in office, um, you know, like so many people, uh, you know quite earnestly believe, um, you know, and well-meaning people too, quite earnestly believe in good faith that Obama would have done a whole lot more, um, but he just didn't have, he just didn't have the room to maneuver. And of course, there's all kinds of holes in that story. Obama had control of all three levels of government um, at the start of his presidency and this, this huge mandate, and he could have done an awful lot. But even after that, there's plenty he could have done um, as well. And so it's important not to let Democrats uh, get away with this stuff. There's a whole lot that they yeah. don't do, not because they're hamstrung or constrained, but because they're actually, you know, conservatively inclined, much more so than their official branding, uh, you know, suggests. 
Yeah, I, I, th I think that that's that's absolutely true, and and the Obama is a great example, and and uh, you know they, and in fact the idea that Obama could have done more was often treated, but with um, derision mm -hmm. uh, by the uh, by by the mainstream like liberal. Yeah, like, 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 like they, 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 there was this weird dance where like uh, you know while Obama was president, uh, you know like. Jaded, like jaded liberals would constantly like write these articles, like, "Oh, look, people think the presidency is magic. They don't understand that it has such limited power. You know, they can hardly do anything." And then, of course, the second there's ever a chance for a Republican to be president, you know, the same people's story completely flips. Right, <laughs> the most dangerous, terrible thing that ever happened. And in fact, it it kind of turns right. out that the latter part is true. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, by extension, you know, um, you know, you you could have been doing some damage on your own. You know. Yeah, no, no, exactly right. Like the like the second uh, obviously is true, and you know, in, in many ways, you know, I mean, the Trump administration uh, has uh, has done uh, tremendous damage in all kinds of you know in all kinds of areas, even besides the really high profile stuff like child separation. Um, you know, I did. You know, doubling the rate of drone strikes in Yemen, uh, you know, like filling the National Labor Relations Board with hardcore union busters, uh, you know, like they've been on this tear uh, since losing the election, you know, and of course, you know, whatever Trump says, they know they lost it. And so they've been trying to like do everything they can possibly do mm -hmm. uh, in the next couple of months, you know, to, uh, you know, to do, to do further damage uh, before they, uh, before they lose office, like, uh, like trying to, um, you know, age, you know, people at agency levels, you know, trying to uh, to get rid of, you know, various like rules that protect worker safety when it comes to stuff like long distance trucking. Uh, and so, and, and actually a lot of this has even been done like without like having, um, um, you know, without having anybody in the official positions that are supposed to run these things, uh, which is also a really important precedent as far as what Biden, you know, again, he, he's not going to want to, but what you could do if you did want to, uh, that, you know, because one of the big excuses we're going to hear is, oh, well, look, I mean, obviously it would be wonderful if, if there were super progressive people appointed to some of these positions, but uh, but look, you know, the Republicans are probably going to control the Senate, you know, unless the you know, Democrats win both those races in Georgia. Uh, and so, um, and and so what are you going to do, right? You can't get anybody confirmed. Uh, you know, even you know, even near a Tandon is going to be too, you know, left wing, you know. For, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, so so how can you possibly blame Biden for the outcome? Of course, he had to appoint super moderate people, you know, to uh, to get past Mitch McConnell. But it seems like there's a Trump precedent for what to do about that. Yeah, it's 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 really. Um, I, I think yeah, I think you know Trump Trump will offer um, a good model of getting your way you know like there's a, like I, I think that there's a there's 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 a tremendously good precedent for it and um yeah and i i think i mean i i personally am really hoping that the democrats um you know do win in georgia um you know just for the sort of um immediate things that i think they can do like um some pandemic relief um in, in you know with uh Steny Hoyer like limits, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but I think that like their ability to um, do the minimum to ease suffering will be greatly um, increased. But also, just yeah, no excuses. Yeah, exactly. Like if like, like I always, you know, we can, you know, it, it sort of sounds like a joke, but I really mean it. Like if you, you know, I mean, if, if you hate the Democrats and who can blame you, uh, then uh, then. Uh, then that act that's actually a reason uh, if you live in Georgia, you know, to uh, to vote uh, for these uh, for these for these candidates, because why would you deliver them on a you know gold plate? This excuse not to do anything, you know, for uh, for the next few years, you know, so you can like, like say, oh, you know, everything is the fault of Mitch McConnell. And I understand that they'll have, you know, it's not like they don't have a never ending series of excuses, but like some of them are going to be more persuasive to a larger group of people than others, you know, so we should yeah. have deny them like the really plausible sounded excuse for um you know for for not doing anything which is oh you know it's, it's all you know it's all mitch definitely yeah and i'm i'm actually pretty optimistic that fewer people are going to buy that uh this time around than they did after 2008 it's kind of a shameless plug but i just wrote about this for the atlantic and and oh, you know kind of arguing that that 
you know, the kind of progressive left, the activist left can't repeat, uh, you know, the mistakes of 2008 in kind of, you know, I think we all kind of experienced it in one way or another, the sort of horrendous demobilization that happened as a consequence of Obama's victory, yeah. the kind of ethos that set in that just said, don't worry, the adults have got this, the smart people from Yale and Harvard are in there and they're going to wonkishly solve all the problems. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, the Obama administration assumed, uh, assumed a pretty conservative posture very, very quickly. They made very clear early on that they weren't even going to you know, they, 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 there were promises they'd explicitly made that they really had no intention of keeping, and there wasn't a lot of pushback. Um, this time, I, I think it's relevant. I mean, people might kind of um, people might kind of sniff at this, but I do think it's relevant that there are actually elected Democratic Party lawmakers who are criticizing these cabinet appointments. There are groups like the Sunrise Movement and Justice Democrats and others, um, you know, who are you know making quite a lot of noise about things like the possibility of Rahm Emanuel or Bruce Reed serving in a Biden administration. Um, and, you know, it's it's all well and good to uh, be cynical. And I confess I partake in this plenty about, you know, I don't think these groups are powerful enough to actually stop uh, these appointments or, you know, they might be able to, you know, for example, stop Bruce Reed and then get near a tan and instead or, or something like that, which is which is hardly a hardly a victory. Um, you know, yeah. like instead of instead of getting an extreme neoliberal, you get somebody who's kind of, you know, in 19 in a 1987 paper said Keynesianism is kind of cool or, you know, something like that. And, you know, it's it's hardly a big political victory, but it does matter that, um, you know, the opposition is being registered because it gives people, um, you know, it gives people a sense that there is an alternative to this. None of this is inevitable. And when Democrats don't do the kinds of things that they, you know, you know, indicate, particularly, uh, you know, in the lead up to a presidential election, indicate yeah. that they want to do, um, that that's not because uh, they didn't have the option. It's because they didn't try. Um, and I think that's, uh, I think that's pretty important. And I'm optimistic that this time around, uh, we're not going to really see a repeat of 2008, um, when so many people kind of switched off and, and just uh, deferred to the administration. I agree. I think um, I think it's a completely different political landscape than than 2008. And um, and, you know, just, you know, just the things you mentioned, I mean, having, you know, uh, or like organized, you know, are like these these very democratic socialist or progressive or very progressive uh, elected lawmakers, um, like just even having just a few of them really changes the narrative, um, even if it doesn't change um, that much about the ab actual mechanism of state power and um, and the uh, um, and having the like much more organized um like left wing forces on the ground, um, like you know, in the like the the climate movement and the the socialists. I mean, it's it's huge. It's yeah, like, yeah. So, so, um, yeah. Whereas, like, in the Obama era, it was like the um, you know the the organized movements were you know kids who had volunteered for Obama. Um, right. Basically, you know, or kids who had volunteered for Howard Dean a few years before then. Yeah, I was I was just going to say, I mean, an insurgent primary campaign in like the mid 2000s was Howard Dean or it was that ridiculous. Yeah. It was like the Netroots Nation people primarying, uh, getting uh, Ned Lamont to primary Joe Lieberman yeah. in Connecticut, beating him and then losing in the general when he ran as an independent. And today, yeah. you know, an insurgent primary campaign is, you know, AOC winning in Queens in the Bronx or Ilhan Omar or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it is a completely different political land. Yeah, I mean, as late as 2008, what passed for economic populism was John Edwards. That's how, how that's how low the bar was. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and if nothing else, right? I mean, like, they're, so uh, the, the best case scenario, of course, for relentlessly pointing out all these things that Biden could do is that then there will be successful pressure on him to do it. But, uh, but the, um, but even if that doesn't, you know, that doesn't happen and, you know, I, I, um, try not to, you know, like I, I, I try to summon up optimism about this, but I'm certainly not holding my breath, you know, uh, that uh, even if that doesn't happen, I think it does usefully, um, you know, bolster that kind of alternative, you know, uh, that uh, you can, you know, because people who would, you know, could have gravitated towards something, right? Like, like something in the 2016 election, 
something uh, Bernie got into a little bit of trouble for was that uh, you know Hillary like unearthed you know these points where he where he was like uh, responding to some interview question in like 2011 or something and saying oh yeah somebody should primary uh, Obama uh, and mm -hmm. uh, and and that played so badly because even you know I mean look I mean I. I remember at the time thinking it was weird and, you know, it's not a bad thing. It's, it's, it, it's a healthy indicator of political movement, but I, I thought it was super weird. Every time I saw these cars with the Bernie, you know, 2016 sticker right next to the Obama uh, 2012 sticker. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but that that's the thing because that idea that Obama was doing everything he possibly could have, uh, yeah. you know, that, that really he wants everything that you do, but, you know, but he's just, you know, realistic and constrained and, you know, and, and, what are you supposed to do? It's all the Republicans' fault. You know, it was so incredibly powerful that even in 2016, when the landscape had started to change, it was like bad for Bernie. Uh, you know, you know, he he didn't. Um, you know, I think he probably rightly, you know, didn't want to go quite into the teeth of it. You know, he was like a little bit evasive, you know, about this because uh, that you know saying anything bad about Obama even in 2016 played incredibly badly. Whereas mm -hmm. I think uh, if you know, not that I expect, you know, we're necessarily going to get a Bernie-like figure in, you know, 2024, but, uh, but you know, for whatever sort of, whatever sort of openings there are for some sort of successful confrontation with the Democratic Party establishment, it can only be helped by having people, you know, be like very aware of, you know, these gaps between, you know, what they actually could do and what they are doing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it, yeah, I think it's uh, that that's right. People are getting much more sophisticated about that. Um, and, you know, that, that, you know, all Democrats are not the same. And I think on, along those lines, um, I mean, I, I don't think that Biden per se is going to be, um, I mean, unless he turns, you know, unless the left pressures him to be really great, he's not going to be as popular as Obama was. I mean, like he's like, he, he actually may, due to the different political climate um, and, you know, the state of the world, you know, um, he, he may be forced to be a much, much better and more left-wing president than Obama. But I, I don't think people... Um, believe in him the same way. I mean, I, I think that like that there's much more. Um, I think there's much more skepticism, um, and the and that the party's grassroots base that worked so hard um, for him was really, I mean, mainly um, wanting correctly to avert another four years of Trump. You know, it's not. Uh, he. I don't think that people feel the same kind of like, oh, it's a whole new day. Yeah, no, for, I, I think that's. I think that's for sure, and I think that's incredibly encouraging. Uh, I, I did just want to be before we go. There's two quick things I wanted to hit. So one of them uh, is about what we were talking about earlier. You know, we've been talking about everything that um, you know that that Biden you know could do if he wanted to, uh, but as far as the sort of more long-term things about Walmart. We talked about unionizing and we said that, um, and, you know, I mean, I don't expect anybody to just magically have an answer to this, but I'm curious about both of your thoughts that, uh, that there seems to be this like horrible, um, you know, catch 22 there, uh, or at least it seems, seems that way to me. Maybe you don't think so that they, that on the one hand um, it looks like we'd have to have some amazing electoral breakthroughs uh, to uh, to change the um, uh, you know to to change the political dimension to make it easier uh, to unionize companies like Walmart, but on the other hand, it it seems like the best path towards having um, electoral breakthroughs for the left does involve having like a, a much stronger labor movement on the ground. You know that that has been the sort of thing organized working class has been the base of successful you know labor and socialist parties uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, so, uh, so it's, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit hard sometimes to see how you get, you know, either one, right. I mean, if, if you need a stronger labor movement, you know, to, to have, uh, effective political action and, uh, the, and it might not be possible, you know, or there, there are real limits to what you, how much you can strengthen the labor movement without a better political climate to make it easier to unionize these places, then what do you do? Go ahead, Liza. Oh, I mean, it is a hard question. We can't either. We can either of us can go. Um, I, I guess. 
I mean, one of the things is, um, um, I, I think, um, that, I mean, there is, there, there is, there, there is a third option, which is, um, you know, you know, people, um, I, and I think we probably will see more of this. Um, people will, um, people will learn how to strike. Um, you know, I mean, or people will relearn how to strike. I mean, American workers were just constantly on strike throughout the 19th century. Um, and, um, you know, employers were not nice, like they were not like good people. They were like utterly ruthless capitalists. They would like um, often kill workers who were trying to agitate and organize in their workplaces. But a, a lot of um, a, a lot of um, discipline of the employing of the employer class by workers um, was was possible through like um, wildcat strikes and. Um, and um, and more um, militant workplace action. Um, 250 million people just went on strike in India. Um, and um, it was kind of funny, we were having a little social media conversation about this, um, about how we hadn't seen much um, coverage of this in the Western media. And um, a Bangladeshi journalist friend of mine said, well, you know, this happens all the time in India, so it's not really newsworthy. <laughs> and, uh, and all of us Americans were like, okay, you know. But I mean, so uh, like there's just, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of habits that we as Americans will um, need to recover in order to change our society. Um, and some of them were already ready recovering, like, socialist organ electing socialists to public office um, and um, and you know thinking seriously about state power um, but um, but radical workplace action is certainly going to be another one yeah and I mean I, I don't have a I don't have a great answer to this um, because as you say Ben it's it's really a catch-22 um, you know the goal is to build you know is to, is to build up labor power. Uh, how do you do that without winning state power? How do you win state power for that agenda unless you build up labor power? You know, it is it is kind of a, you know, it's a it's a it's a difficult predicament. Um, but I think the the best kind of analog for what needs to happen is is what we've seen on the right in kind of a decades long assault on the trade union movement. Um, you know, there's there's you know in in uh, you know, in that uh, in in that war, as in so many of the other wars, the Republican Party successfully waged. You know, there's no kind of one big incident. There's no one big victory that you know that that undoes everything. Um, you know, it's a series of piecemeal victories, victories at the local level, victories at the state level. Some of which are electoral victories, and some of which are non-electoral victories. Um, you know, and and that you know they're kind of the big ones people recognize, like Scott Walker in in Wisconsin and things like that. Um, but uh, but I think, you know, that's kind of how uh, the kind of reverse shock doctrine approach that the left needs to take, uh, whether it's, you know, electorally or, or non-electorally, you know, that's kind of very much the course uh, we need to follow. And that's very much kind of the time frame and the trajectory that we all need to, to have in mind. You know, this is not going to be, I mean, barring the election of somebody like a Bernie Sanders, this is not going to be some kind of massive shock to the system. It's going to be uh, a series of different kinds of victories that gradually, you know, change the culture and amount to, um, you know, amount to a kind of a, a, a type of economy where workers are just much more powerful than they are now. And then uh, if they become sufficiently powerful, you know, the entire political culture will, will, uh, will bend around that and governments, whether they're, um, you know, Republican or Democrat, whatever their kind of nominal ideological allegiance to, uh, we'll have to we'll have to move uh, in response to that, right? And and you know we've seen uh, you know to go back to kind of um, the, the the rightward shift that the Republicans have successfully ushered in over the past few decades um, with Democratic help. You know uh, we've seen how uh, you know just reducing the power of labor uh, drags the entire you know the entire ethos of national politics to the right. You know Bill Clinton didn't just govern to the right of Jimmy Carter. He governed to the right of Richard Nixon, you know. Um and we need that we need that to happen in the other direction. Yeah, exactly. And we you know we we see that, you know, globally in the past we have seen examples where the left has done the same thing that the right has done here. You know, this is like this is how the left won in Sweden. There there was it was a gradual 
um, you know, from from the ground up um, process or the Workers' Party in Brazil when they like when they took power. I mean, same thing. And um, you know, I was a very um, like I was I was a big Bernie supporter also, but um, but but it's actually unlikely that we're going to get the kind of society we want delivered that way you know, from the ground up by the most awesome president, you know, I mean, like, even if Bernie Sanders had been elected, um, we haven't built the kind of ground up left, um, um, you know, left controlled institutions and state power at every level that would support um, a Bernie Sanders in power doing the things he wanted to do. Of course, I mean, for the reasons we've just discussed about executive power and all the things, it would have been great. Sure. Um, I mean, he could have done a lot, um, but like it would have been extremely um, challenging to make um, real long-term social transformation that way. Yeah, I mean, it's, it seemed like the Bernie calculation was that you could do things in the opposite order to uh, to how uh, how it's happened elsewhere. That you could have uh, that that you could have this sort of like lightning rod thing, you know, at, at the at the top of society where uh, you you would have had um, you know this person who was using the presidential bully pulpit to to help sort of try to organize that lower level stuff uh, and uh, and. A, think it was certainly worth trying, but I mean, it, yeah, it's totally. like, I mean, we try everything, but there just isn't yeah. really much precedent for that actually working. Yeah. Yeah. That seems right. Um, so in, um, so for the reasons we just finished discussing, not soon, but if, uh, if in a, uh, in a future scenario where there was a socialist government holding enough levers of power that you could actually decide what to do, um about uh about walmart uh then you know i think that the thing um you know i'm sure there'd be like a debate about like different uh different possible uh you know ways of 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 handling this you know that uh that they're you know you could uh you know uh you know there might be people wanting to like break it up or localize it or running it as a uniquop or something the thing that would make most sense to me uh would uh, would be to just just nationalize Walmart and just have it run as like the, you know, like, like, you know, just call it like America Mart or something, you know, that you, uh, you could just have, uh, have this be a, um, you know, be like a federally owned, like public option for groceries. Uh, but, uh, but I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know if either of you wanted to uh, weigh in on that before we cut it for today. I, I don't I, I don't know what I mean I would be interested in that uh, debate and I know that uh, you know Mihail and 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 Lee wrote a piece called Nationalized Walmart for Jacobin recently which went or maybe Ben maybe in fact it was you that wrote that yeah, yeah. it was you excuse me uh, but ba but based on based on uh, partly on the on the arguments they made in their book um, you know and that's 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 certainly that's certainly interesting um, I mean it, it it's funny it's a little taboo to suggest public ownership of something like uh something like walmart right but uh uh you know but it might actually make sense from an efficiency standpoint i mean one thing i've always found very funny is that the you know the kind of right-wing stereotype of what you know uh, a socialist economy looks like is like oh you can only you know there's only a handful of like state-owned warehouses where you can get you can get things or whatever and it's like you drive uh you know every major city has multiple strips you know that's just that are just like the same five you know, the same five companies. It's like, that's kind of what we already have under, under capitalism. And, you know, you get some national variation or international variation of that, but like effectively uh, you just, in, in, you know, in a European context or whatever, you would just have like something that is functionally the same as Walmart. It's just not called Walmart. Um, so actually maybe it shouldn't be so, so taboo to think about uh, things in those terms. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's like, um, um, that Allen Ginsberg poem of America, when can I go into the grocery store and buy what I need with my good looks? <laughs> 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 Why not? <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm, all, I'm always saying it. <laughs> we, we, we get in this trap of being like, uh, of, of being like, well, you know, healthcare shouldn't be commodified because it's so important, but you know, well, you know, why is that there? I mean, you know, food is extremely important <laughs> and, you know, shelter and you know, all the rest of it.
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think maybe like some people like are a little bit afraid about like when they think about nationalized grocery stores, you think about like they like, you know, Soviet grocery stores, you know, uh, that you know, that like and, and the problems and inefficiencies that exist in that system. But, um, you know, I, I think like, I don't know, whatever, like I, th I think if only... Um, you know, I, I'm sh like, I think if, uh, I think if only UPS existed, you know, we might think about the idea of a post office that way, you know, like it's, it's mm -hmm. not, uh, you know, it's, it's not at all obvious to me why, you know, you couldn't like have that, like, you know, again, even like, even without quite going to the Allen Ginsberg thing, uh, I love that poem, but like, even without, you know, quite going to, you know, you can get groceries, you know, buy for pay for groceries with your good looks, you know, like, I mean, like you, that, like you could. Or your not so good looks, I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, you know, whatever, you know, that, uh, that you could, um, that, you know, it, it seems like just having, um, I mean, look, there are there are small communities. There was like a little rash of articles about this, like I think last year, maybe, you know, like there are small communities that because like uh, there just wasn't like a grocery store in town, like even like places in like red states where people are pretty ideologically, you know, hostile to socialism, you know, where they like there are like cities that own their own little grocery stores, you know, because like it was just a sort of pragmatic mm -hmm. decision that they made. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, um, you know, it, it doesn't really seem like you know you could like it, it you know i don't think that there's a good reason in principle you know um in principle why you couldn't have that and you know even if it wasn't like distributing food for free uh not them against that either you know but like even if it wasn't you know even if it wasn't doing that you know it could still um you know it could be like the post office right I and mean, the post office charges you for stamps but you know not much mm -hmm. So anyway, something worth thinking about. Thank you both. Uh, really appreciate uh, both of your time. Really liked your article, Luke. Uh, thank you so much as always, both of you. Cheers. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. All right. Uh, it was uh, Liza Featherstone, uh, who's a columnist for, uh, for Jacobin. Uh, Luke Savage, uh, who's a staff writer for Jacobin. He wrote an article uh, that uh, came out uh, pretty recently uh, called a cl uh, class war at Walmart. Um, and uh, got to have uh, a few more of these coming up this week. It's actually gonna be pretty action packed. So uh, tomorrow I'm just doing the standard midweek live stream, you know, to uh, take chat questions. Uh, and on Thursday, I am going to be joined by Forrest Miller, uh, who is the producer uh, for, uh, for this, uh, the show and this channel. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's the, uh, he's our, uh, he's our video editor. He's also a huge film buff. And since I've been wanting to do more cultural content, you know, it's kind of along the lines of those monthly Sopranos, uh, recap bonus episodes. Uh, I'm going to be doing a series of live streams with Forrest, uh, where we, um, uh, we talk about, uh, Scorsese movies. So the first one is going to be Casino. Uh, and we're going to be doing that on Thursday. These are all at 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Uh, try to keep it at 5 p.m. Uh, so consistency, people know when, it's, uh, when it is. Obviously, there are exceptions if, like, we do an unexpected stream because some news event happens. Uh, but And then on Friday, uh, I am going to be doing just a quick... Um, uh, just a quick live stream, like half an hour, 40 minutes, uh, with Bronco Marchetich. Uh, author of uh, Yesterday's Man, The Case Against Joe Biden from Verso. Uh, and um, yeah, actually, I uh, haven't watched much Boardwalk Empire. I like that first one that he directed, the first episode that he directed, but I never really got into the show. Maybe I should give it another chance. But anyway, so i uh, going to be talking on a live stream to uh, Bronco on Thursday um, about uh, Biden's uh, cabinet appointees and, you know, his other appointees, you know, like uh, the odious near attendant at uh, OMB. Uh, and um, and then uh, Saturday, of course, there's no live stream, uh, but uh, because that's when the show is being recorded, that's going to be uh, Natalie Wynn, you know, ContraPoints, and uh, Amber Frost from Chapo. Uh, with Amber, I'm going to be talking about her article about uh, hashtag activism, which is a catalyst, but it's up on the Jacobin website today if anybody wants to check that out. Uh, and then on Sunday, we're going to do the second installment in uh, the live stream series that we started uh, this last Sunday uh, with Matt McManus when we watched and broke down uh, the uh, James Baldwin-William F. Buckley civil rights debate. 
Uh, so for, you know, in general, every Sunday uh, at five, I want to bring in, you know, different guests and watch and break down old debates. Uh, the, uh, this second one, uh, <laughs> hey, don't apologize, you know, don't apologize for that. She's great. Uh, but for the second one, uh, I am going to be uh, doing uh, the um, Hitchens versus Hitchens uh, debate. Uh, so this is uh, Christopher Hitchens debating his brother Peter Hitchens about the war in Iraq. Uh, so, uh, which is a uh, a fun one because, of course, Hitchens had good politics for most of his life, and you know, and still, in many ways, has still had left wing politics at the end of his life. But he took a sharp right turn on foreign policy, of course, and supported the Iraq War. Um, you know, it's a massive stain on his you know lifetime record. Uh, and his brother Peter uh, was this uh, well, very religious very, you know, socially conservative, kind of uh, kind of crazy Tory, uh, still is, Peter's still alive. Um, and uh, in, um, towards, you know, near the end of, uh, you know, uh, not quite the end, you know, he still has his hair, but, you know, but late in, uh, in Hitchens' life, uh, Christopher and Peter did the two back-to-back -back debates. Uh, uh, so they're fairly, you know, they're short debates and they just did them back-to-back. Uh, one about the Iraq War, one about uh, God and religion. Uh, so I am going to uh, try to see if I can get uh, Jeremy Johnson to uh, come on to watch the uh, the second one with me in a couple weeks. Uh, but uh, this Sunday, I'm going to be watching the first one, the Iraq one, with uh, Gene Bajalan and David Slavic. Uh, so that should be uh, that should be a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, still figuring out the stuff that's coming up uh, next week. Uh, but I have nailed down that next Thursday, uh, Eric Levitz and Daniel Bessner, who are, of course, both returning champs for uh, GTAA, are going to uh, to come back. Uh, yeah, uh, I think they – well, again, it was on the same night. So they were both in Michigan, I believe, at uh, Grand Valley State University. Um, so uh, so Eric Levitz and Daniel Bessner are both going to be coming back uh, to uh, the live stream uh, um, next Wednesday. Uh, so I'll probably do the regular uh, midweek one on Thursday. I'm not sure, but they're going to be back next Wednesday uh, to argue about uh, fascism analogies for Trump uh, and and how that relates to you know left critiques of liberalism, uh, which um, Eric uh, wrote a uh, wrote in you know interesting as always. Even when I even when I disagree with him, I very often agree with him. Even when I disagree with him, I always think he's interesting. Uh, he wrote a um, an article about this, you know, for uh, for New York Mag. Uh, you know, intelligence where he writes, um, sort of criticizing both sides of the, uh, the the Trump fascism debate. And, you know, Daniel made a critical comment on it on Twitter and I asked if they both wanted to come back and talk about it here. So uh, we are going to be doing that uh, next uh, <laughs> next Wednesday. Uh, I like that. Uh, tonight we dine on, you know, like 300, you know, tonight we dine online. Uh, so... Um, yeah, and I agree with you, Dave. I think that's, I think, you know, I think Hitchens' position on Iraq was a moral and political disaster, of course. Uh, but I think it's it's interesting to try to unpack how he got there instead of just calling, you know, saying, oh, he was a sellout, you know, he was being, he was a grifter, he was being insincere. I don't believe any of that. I think that he was a very earnest person who shared a lot of our premises and made it to this horrifyingly wrong conclusion. And I think it's much more interesting to try to see uh, how he got there, right? That's my perspective, certainly on Hitchens. But, uh, but anyway, so, uh, so yeah, Levitz and, um, and, and uh, Danny Bessner are going to be back here uh, on Wednesday. And, um, and then, uh, like I said, probably going to be doing, uh, you know, going to be doing the first Hitchens Hitchens debate on uh this sunday and then maybe uh if uh if jeremy is interested uh in uh, in doing that with me um and we're going to be doing the uh, the other hitchens hitchens debate the uh, the religion one uh the uh, the following sunday uh at some point uh at some point uh doug lane has already said that he wants to uh, come on to do the uh, destiny michael albert debate about participatory economics uh that one we might have to break into a few segments because it's very long like a lot of destiny's debates uh, and then in um, uh, and then uh, Matt McManus has already said that he's going to come back to do the um, the uh, uh, Chomsky Foucault debate uh, and might see if uh, Russ Sabriglia wants to uh, wants to join us for that too. 
So um, all of that should be a lot of fun. Uh, really appreciate as always, everybody, you know, came by uh, and, um, you know, and, uh, and, and showed up and watched and asked questions always means a lot to me. So uh, see people tomorrow uh, again for the usual midweek live stream, you know, take some super chat questions, just talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. Uh, and, uh, and then, like I said, uh, Forrest talking about the Scorsese's movie Casino on Thursday, uh, Bronco on, uh, on Friday, uh, to talk about the Biden cabinet picks, uh, then, um, uh, on Sunday, um, David Slavic, uh, and, uh, Gene Bajalan, uh, to, uh, to talk about, uh, the Hitchens, uh, Hitchens rock debate. So looking forward to all of that. Thank you guys all again. Um, left is best. <laughs>